and I want you to have an enjoyable lunch. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody, thank you very, very much indeed for taking the time out of your day to come to this. It's going to be a little bit of a whistle-stop tour about kind of context um, and a few ideas and examples, because um, I don't know everybody's kind of background and what your specific interests or knowledge is. So excuse me if it's all, you all feel it's, this is really basic and you know it all, um, but hopefully there's um, some interesting examples from the UK and there's also a few clips to, you know, keep you entertained um, kind of along the way. Um, and I think we were going to have the um, lights down so you can see the slides and the clips a bit better. Is that, that's okay, yeah? Yeah, great, 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 great. Also, um, there's, some of my slides have a lot of text Please don't feel you need to read it all. It's really, it's really sort of additional information. Um, so you know the, t the the slides. Each one, each slide is there to make a point, but don't feel you need to read all the text that's on the slide. So I might go too fast for you to read some of the text, but it don't don't think that you're missing out on anything. It's just to kind of make the slide in general to make a point, not necessarily to read everything that's on there. Um, so um, streaming giants um, like Netflix and Amazon have become increasingly dominant internationally across all aspects of the film world, from production to exhibition. And the rise of these online platforms has caused great concern as to the future viability of cinema going, um, as we know it as a form of public entertainment. So the talk will look at these issues um, including some innovative strategies and in cinemas in the UK have used to keep, keep audiences coming through the doors. So it is about the UK because that's my experience, um, but I hope it's relevant um, and interesting and it'd be great to hear at the end about specific examples or um, ideas in terms of Croatian <coughs> cinemas um, or, or, or indeed anywhere, because um, I know that we're, there's representatives from a range of different com countries in, in the room. Um, so we see the streaming giants breaking down the industry's traditional divisions and roles from production through distribution and exhibition and the distinction between film and television and super platforms, as, as they're often known, becoming broadcasters, distributors and studios. And this is still very current. Here um, last week um, in St. Petersburg was the, the Association of Film um, Commissioners inaugural um, um, meeting and um, not as this is certainly a slide you don't necessarily need to, to uh, read, it's just to show that this is very much a current subject um, that is being discussed by um, the, the kind of high level executives, movers and shakers of the industry. So I think probably a lot of you know um, that this, um, the the issue came to a head in Cannes last year um, between um, Netflix um, and Cannes with um, a Cannes Film Festival uh, refusing to show um, Alfonso Cuaron's film Roma. Um, and this is because um, it was uh, not going to have the requisite sort of what we call in the UK windows. So the, 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 release in, the time between release in cinemas and the time that, it, that something goes on other platforms or online. In fact, not only was it not going to have the re requisite windows, it wasn't going to have a window at all. So it wasn't going to be in cinemas at all. Um, so um, uh, can refused um, to, to show this among um, a couple of other titles. But things are, are not quite as straightforward as that. The, the issue, um, because the previous year, um, Can had shown um, Jane Campion's um, Top of the Lake, which is television. So there's this sort of like, this didn't get a release in cinemas either. It's a, it's a, it's a what they call high-end television. So there's a slightly, um, slightly inconsistency in the view there. Um, but the issue wasn't about festival curating, it's about France's film industry's industrial politics. Um, and um, uh, if Net um, so they, they were saying that if Netflix would make the films available to them, then they, they wouldn't have a, a problem showing them in the festival. Um, but as they saw, streaming was damaging the business and damaging <laughs> French film culture. Um, uh, they were seeing that um, titles just being watched online and audiences falling away at the cinema and generally changing the nature 
of film culture in France, which of course is, is very much about conversations about films, about writing about films, about intellectualising films, in a way that perhaps other countries' film cultures aren't always like that, but certainly preeminently um, France is like that. But Venice didn't care. Um, so Venice happily picked up Roma and Alberto uh, Barbera, the uh, artistic director of Venice, um, was controversial for a, a number of reasons, um, um, particularly in this year's festival, but um, for him, uh, Cannes turning this film down was, was very much to his advantage. But Cannes holding firm, so... Um, uh, this year as well, this it was the same message. Um, they were they were not going to show um, uh, uh, um, films that were not going to be released in cinemas in France. And um, Thierry Fimo, of course, stressing here, we are not here to show films that will not be shown for cinemas. Quite unequivocal there. Um, but it's not just Europeans speaking out. Uh, and there's uh, Meryl Streep, uh, The Irishman, um, which is a film that wasn't shown in Cannes. And Spielberg um, notably came into, um, came into the fray um, to try to persuade um, the um, um, American Academy, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences who um, uh, award the Oscars to change their policies. And these were um, some of the arguments that he used um, uh, in terms of trying to get that. Um, um, and, and made a very persuasive case that this, this should... Um, the, the Academy should change their category so that um, uh, the films weren't uh, eligible for awards if they hadn't um, had a, a requisite theatrical release. Um, and here, um, Helen Mirren um, um, has launched a broadside against uh, Netflix um, at CinemaCon in Las Vegas um, with this uh, statement. And Mirren continued about, there's nothing like sitting in the cinema um, um, uh, and uh, but at the same time um, she's I think quite articulated some of our um, some of all our feelings about Netflix we probably wouldn't want to do without it um, but at the same time we're kind of very aware that uh, the damage it might be doing to the, the cinema going experience as we know it and Netflix's response um, they say they love cinema, this is their response to Steven Spielberg, but access to people who can't afford it or live in towns without theatres, um, and um, giving filmmakers more ways to share their art. Um, and they say these things are not mutually exclusive, which you think perhaps is that some small kind of olive branch, well, well, we'll see. Um, but in some ways that uh, is uh, um, that you can't argue necessarily with that statement, but at the same time, what are the implications? So um, you, are, you don't really know who, to, who this bloke, you don't really need to know who this bloke is, but um, <laughs> he's, um, uh, he was um, a viewer of a big commercial chain in the UK, and he was, again, has a little bit of a mixed message where he was lobbying BAFTA, the British Academy, to change their rules um, about eligibility for films for awards. Um, but at the same time, he was saying that his, he would love to show games, Game of Thrones in his cinema. So, you know, there's mixed messages kind of coming out here. So a very strong player in the UK is uh, this guy, Philip Natchball, who's um, head of the cinema chain um, uh, Curzon and the boss of Curzon Artificial Eye, who's the UK's main, by, by quite some way, distributor of um, art cinema. Um, and so he's, but he's, they have their own um, Curzon Home Cinema, which is their own online player, and he's been very uh, voracious in supporting that and all of their releases having day and date so simultaneously in cinemas and online. Um, uh, um, and, uh, and he's, a, a, he's uh, let's just say he's a, quite an aggressive businessman, but he's a very a forward thinker. So um, he's very cleverly, rather than sit around sort of like... Um, uh, uh, bemoaning the state of affairs, he approached Netflix and got his company the deal to to to, to do a limited release of Roma in the UK. So rather than seeing 
this as a sort of <coughs> a standoff. He's seen it as a business opportunity. And now, um, Curzon Artificial Eye, our Netflix's um, preferred distributor of their films in the UK, and they're bringing out films such as The Irishman um, in November. So it's quite a, uh, it's, it's quite a clever move from him. Um, but the, um, that, that's all very well, but um, the independent sector, which is quite strong, this is a lovely cinema called The Watershed in Bristol, and they've been saying how they're, they're discussed that that's maybe okay for Curse and Artificial Eye to play Roma in their, and the other titles in their cinemas, but what about the independent cinemas around the country who, don't, who aren't, can't play those to their audiences? So this is an unbalancing of the exhibition scene with one chain having access to these films and um, not other cinemas. And of course that's unprecedented because generally you can book whichever films um, you, 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 know, you would want to as a cinema. So... Um, the other side of the debate is Picture House, which is the big rival to Curzon, um, and then they have they have gone backwards, and now they're saying they will not play any films in their cinemas that don't adhere to the 16-week window between release and, and online streaming. And this, of course, means that they won't be playing any Curzon Artificial Eye films. So this is a big, um, uh, big uh, situation um, in the UK at the moment. So um, some people s applaud them for standing firm to their principles, and others say that they're it's about um, a, it's a business competition, and they're really kind of cutting off their nose to to spite their face. They are also a distributor, but a much smaller um, distributor than than Curzon. Um, so the Academy <coughs> didn't listen to Steven Spielberg and left the Netflix celebrity rule in, intact. I mean, I say Netflix, but please extrapolate that to, to all the kind of uh, major streamers. Um, so that was a very uh, big disappointment for Spielberg. Um, and they're set to grow. Amazon will take over UK cinema box office spending by 2020. A big um, PwC Price Waterhouse Coopers are a very big accountancy, uh, international accountancy company. Although they don't always know everything, do they? But this is what the prediction is, um, and that DVD and Blu-ray will go into to terminal decline. Um, and of course, there are more on the way. Oh, no, I've got this, I've got this one. Um, yeah, the other thing is about, um, of course, um, uh, Netflix originals um, need uh, pr places to make their films, and there is a sort of <coughs> process of localisation, and being, there are films and TV series being made around the world. Um, and Netflix is, is going to take over Shepperton Studios in the UK, um, this is a quote from Amanda Neville, who's chair of, uh, chief executive of the British Film Institute, saying it's all very wonderful. Um, part of her job is to um, increase business and um, what they call inward investment in terms of the film industry at large. But then a lot of then a lot of UK producers are very concerned that this means that they don't have access to these facilities now they've been taken over, because also Disney have taken over the UK's biggest studio, Paramount. So uh, this leaves a very difficult situation. Although some people snipe back and say that British movies are so small they don't they can't afford to use these studios anyway. Um, so yeah, so still expanding. Facebook is already there. Um, YouTube, of course, and and um, very set to be a very big player. Apple um, uh, and Apple of launched very recently um, and the interesting thing of course because of this complicated field Steven Spielberg makes amazing stories for um, Apple despite his stand against um, streaming services uh, in terms of movies um, and Apple um, uh, launched last month um, and um, uh, it looks to be a standoff between the new Disney um, streaming service and Apple TV um, um, and uh, here we are with Oprah Winfrey um, representing um, Apple TV here. So that we work, that it remains to see what dominant force they'll be in that space and what their kind of product will be. So um, 
the wandering <laughs> this is you might think this is a, a side but it's just about to kind of show you really about the ambitions of these global companies and it's important to remember that they are global and even though they they do operate um, sometimes uh, more locally and do produce work, uh, films and TV series in different countries it's important to remember that they are you know American owned uh, global companies so next Netflix has picked up this blockbuster, Chinese blockbuster, The Wandering Earth, which became the second highest grossing film in China. And um, the irony, of course, is Netflix then screens this film around the world, everywhere, well, pretty much everywhere, except China, where Netflix is, uh, uh, is not allowed to operate. And I just thought you might be kind of interested, because... I mean, you may be very extremely familiar with Chinese blockbusters um, and be able to tell us a thing or two about them. But if you're not, I just thought you might be interested to see the trailer. Um, so that's pretty, it's pretty dramatic. Um, I mean, I, I quite like to see it because it's just, it clearly um, uh, is based on a kind of American model of sort of sci-fi blockbusters. But at the same time, it feels kind of different. And so I'm quite, I'm quite keen to actually watch it on Netflix. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm... Um, um, so there is, a, but there is also that element to what Netflix can do is bring films that from around the world, which would not be viable to play, <coughs> which would not have a large enough audience that, um, um, but would be, but as a as a form of kind of cultural ex exchange is a is a is a new channel for doing that. Um, so returning to um, the, the present moment, um, so are these are two of the. To, uh, the Marriage Story, which um, this photo is from, of um, Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson, um, and The Irishman, the new Martin Scorsese film, um, uh, for Netflix are obviously two incredibly um, big films. Um, and, um, uh, the, uh, and I think it shows that the world has shifted quite dramatically since Netflix spent £50 million promoting last year's um, Oscar title, Roma, um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, and uh, the morning after the, the, the their film, the their Roma won um, three three of the uh, fifteen Oscars that it was nominated for, but not be be uh, best picture. Netflix stock was um, uh, um, was at three hundred and sixty seven dollars. Um, uh, and um, ar around now it's 288, so it's kind of fallen. Um, and it's kind of interesting, I think this gives a sort of slightly different kind of feeling that ne makes Netflix lo look a bit more human. Um, and also the fact that Netflix is no longer the only kid on the block, as we know, no, no longer occupies um, the, the role of studio bo bogeyman. Um, and be between sort of Disney Plus, Hula, Apple Plus, HBO Max, and Amazon, there's a, no a lot of competition now. And against that crowd, Netflix looks suspiciously, possibly controversially, 
like possibly the good guy. Um, in the ongoing battle to reduce the 90-day theatrical window, Netflix fought for 45 days for Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. And it lost the battle, but major exhibitors were willing to consider 75 days. So there is kind of progress. In, this is in, in, in terms of the US. Um, and it's kind of learned a lot since its first film, Beasts of No Nation, in 2015. Um, and it's also realised, I think, that marketing is key and that by having theatrical distribution, um, that is a great marketing showcase. And that the then the Oscars lure name filmmakers and that they enhance a movie's value for subscribers. Um, and I think this is certainly possibly the thinking behind these two sort of stellar in-house productions. Um, uh, and also... Um, uh, the Fernando Mireas, The Two Popes, um, which is also um, played very well in Toronto. Um, both, um, they're crowd pleasers that will not only play well in the big screens, but also on Netflix, um, and also viewed by the increasingly global Academy voters. So the controversy kind of rumbles on. Um, and this... Um, in um, that um, Scotiabank's theatre in, in Toronto have refused to show festival films from the streaming giants that were particularly Netflix that will um, uh, uh, that won't be open theatrically. So the theatre exhibitors, um, this particular exhibitor in um, Toronto is uh, refusing to play and you can see there's quite big 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 titles down there um, that the festival are having to find other homes for. Um, this is a situation that has threatened to happen in London as well with you remember back um, Tim the view man Tim Richards um, he was very against London Film Festival playing those titles but he kind of conceded because the London Film Festival uses view, view cinemas and Odeon another big chain um, but they were slightly more kind of sanguine about it, saying that the London Film Festival was a private hire event of their of their cinemas, so that they that it was really up to them, up to the festival, what what they programmed. They weren't going to take a view on it. But this is quite interesting that um, exhibitors, um, as well as um, at, uh, as well as the Cannes Film Festival, are taking this um, stand. But there, there is kind of chinks in the armour, um, particularly Amazon gets the full the UK theatrical window, despite um, Amazon's usual strategy. Um, and that, that's very important. Um, and um, so we're in a kind of mixed, we're in a mixed situation where the, the you know, Amazon and Netflix seem to be modulating their, their stance a little bit, giving in a little bit. But then on the other hand, you've got exhi exhibitors, some exhibitors standing firm, and some, exhi some exhibitors like Curzon Artish at Fischelai kind of in embracing this kind of the dual world of cinema release and, and um, streaming. So what else are cinemas doing to try to get people to kind of come back? If we believe what is being said, that streaming is taking cinema, um, audiences from cinemas. What are cinemas doing to, to do something different? Um, so I've got a, a range of examples. They're not all strictly cinema exhibition venues, but there are, there are many of them are, but some of them are sort of cinematic events. And I'll start with the biggest of those, which is secret cinema. So they've... Um, uh, they're they're a, an amazing kind of... Um, uh, a theatrical performance experience of cinema. So they'll um, they'll hire us a very large space. They will create an environment within it, and they will uh, have actors playing roles from the film in the environment. There'll be food, there'll be drink, and you'll watch a movie too. Um, this was one of their biggest um, last year, Blade Runner. They did a massive show with The Empire Strikes Back. Um, and they sell out um, ma massively um, and people want, want it shows that people, even if people have seen these films, that they want to um, uh, that they want to engage with them in a different way and have a, having a sort of bigger than life experience of the film the film beyond the screen 
What's interesting about secret cinema, <laughs> and I haven't been for a while because their ticket prices are astronomical, but when I first started going, they were showing films of, like The Battle of Algiers and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So rather slightly different from um, Blade Runner and... Um, and, and the Empire Strikes Back. And at those times as well, you didn't actually know what the film was going to be. That's why it's called Secret Cinema. But now, they, you know, this mob is obviously working for them, um, and uh, they do tell you what the film is. Um, and they've also just been, um, just, um, just been uh, invited to China to put on a similar event. So I've no idea what the film will be. Maybe it'll be The Wandering Earth. We'll see. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is my local cinema that I know and love, the Rio in Dalston in East London um, and um, these are the kind of people that go there they look quite a lot like the kind of people who go to cinema in Croatia to me um, so I've just put this is uh, you know local cinema's international culture if you can say Eurovision party is international culture that's possibly debatable but they put on a lot of events and party nights as well so they will um, um, so they'll, they'll do uh, they, will, they will show the Eurovision song contest on the big screen and they'll have a, have a big night to, to do that as well so there's um, a number of things that they participate in they're in a, um, a, uh, they're in a particular part of London that has a, a, a very big queer scene and they, they're in a queer festival called Fringe Festival that they work with as well so they're very much kind of part of the community um, and, uh, are very and have renewed success they were, they were struggling for a while um, as, an, as an old cinema worm that was showed quite a traditional kind of art new, new release art programme um, and audiences were dwindling a bit, but they've re just revitalised things very much indeed. They've had a redecoration, and they've uh, got uh, a, a, a now a, a huge, vib vibrant crowd of people that go on a regular basis. So um, it's, it's well worth a visit. It's it's not near a tube station if you're in London, but it's still well worth a visit. Um, they, they um, I've just I've picked the Rio's adverts for these but it could be any pretty much any cinema in London event cinema and I don't know if you have this in Croatia or other countries but it's where theatrical productions or are then kind of being directly into the cinema and um, theatre London's theatre is very popular and although I still have slight qualms about cinemas being used for other art forms the fact that this makes theatre and opera um, uh, accessible to a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford to go or would just feel cultural barriers for them participating. They can go see in their, their local cinemas. And, yeah, I still think that's incredible. And if it also gives the cinema another income stream, well, that can't be bad either. And Fleabag, of course, uh, I don't know if any of you listen to the Emmys. Um, it, um, one big there. Um, and I did prepare this before that. Not this morning, so um, so, that's a, so that's a coincidence. Um, so that, again, so a flea bag is broadcast television, and, but this is a live um, conversation um, with Phoebe Waller Bridge with I guess screening some some new materials. I didn't go to it, um, but again, it's a way of, of of tapping into different forms of popular culture that bring people through the cinema doors. Now. Um, this is, um, these are two recent British films, A Souvenir uh, by Joanna Hogg and Bait um, by Mark Jenkin, who have, have released in the last month, that have done phenomenally well for small, really small films, and they've done phenomenally well in cinemas. Um, and I think um, The Souvenir is distributed by Curzon Artificial Eye, um, so that was... That was um, uh, uh, day and date on the streaming service and so was Bait which was distributed by the BFI who have their own player BFI player so they were both but they both um, outperformed um, uh, by a very large extent um, in the cinema screening so even though you could see them for five pounds or and I think it's more than that um, on on online and you can get you can have all your mates around and you say so you only pay a pound each perhaps um, it's still people are prepared to pay more than that you know um, Half as much again to go and see them. Seeing the tickets in London is very expensive to um, see them in the cinema. And I think one of the reasons is is that a they got really good reviews, but b there's there's this sort of wave of 
of support at the moment for independent British films. It's just like this kind of thing, well, they're original, they're, um, they're films to be proud of, they're films that we should, that people, that the audiences should be supporting. So I don't know if they, they, they probably haven't hit um, Croatia yet, but um, I thought I would show you the trailer for Bait just to see, see what you think. It's very interesting, actually, Mark Jenkin is an artist filmmaker and he works with, a, uh, he shoots on black and white Bolex, which is really rather unusual for a feature film um, with a, a reasonably wide release. Um, so you can see, it's very it's interesting. Um, it's set, set in Cornwall, and really it's about the, the kind of the, the moving in of city people and buying up the old fishermen's cottages in in Cornwall. So the sort of gentrification of rural parts of the UK and the diminishing of being able to earn a living, a, lo a living through local activities like like fishing, um, and it's, again that sort of um, clash of cultures between the the sort of metropolitan elite and the the, the you know, the, the old communities have, have had, had a lifestyle that's existed for, in a sim in very similar way for, for um, many centuries. Um, so other things that uh, I thought, think, thought you might be interested to know about is um, uh, this idea of, of a sustainable cinema. And um, this is um, The Depot, which is a new cinema in uh, Lewis, um, in East Sussex, which is a place near Brighton, if you know the UK. And um, it's a carbon, uh, keeping the carbon um, footprint as low as possible. Um, so every aspect of the cinema has been designed to, um, uh, to, to make it as, as carbon neutral as it possibly can be. Um, and the, and the, the cinema programme supports that ethos. So it's tapping into um, a, 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 a current concern about climate change um, and thinking, well, if we're going to build a new cinema, we don't want it to sort of like damage the damage the climate. We want to make it as uh, as ecologically um, sustainable as possible. But also, part of the ethos of the people who run the cinema is to make sure that it shows films that support that ethos as well. And Lewis is quite an alternative kind of town. You know, it's quite kind of cool and left wing, well, liberal rather than left wing, I guess. Um, but it's, um, so it's, it, people have embraced this very much. There wasn't an independent cinema, there wasn't any cinema in the town before this, so the local people have embraced it. And it's also, as you can see with those umbrellas, um, it's got a really lovely outside garden and great food, and so it's, a, it's an all-round experience, and that's been a huge success. And I think any other cinema, that's new cinema that's built, will be measured against uh, this particular one. And um, this is um, the screen on the green. Now, this is uh, quite near where I live as well. It's in Islington in North London. Um, and they've, um, it's a very old cinema, as you can see. 
um, and they've the view um, uh, chain opened up in Islington and, and um, really kind of affected their business quite considerably. So they have really modified their offer uh, to make it a more upmarket and um, with their food and beverage and comfortable seats here. So you can see that they've got little tables, they've got a bar at the back of the cinema. I mean, I call it sort of a, a olives and rosé kind of cinema. Um, but um, it's, not, it's not what I like, really. Um, uh, I, I think it's... Um, but it, it's smoking, all... No, 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 no smoking against the law, yeah. Um, uh, no, it's a, it's a shame. But... Mm, yeah, but it is a lovely cinema, and they can charge premium ticket price, and um, uh, and they, they keep going in, in that kind of way by selling kind of wine and olives. Um, the other is to sort of think about um, audiences that you that maybe that um, aren't coming to the cinema. So young audiences. Um, this is um, um, uh, this is from the. Um, independent cinema office which exists to promote um, independent um, cinemas in the UK and just they're pointing out here that it's not fair to blame young people for the fact that they're not going to cinemas that's really up to them the thing is to make cinemas attractive and, and compelling for cinemas to go and there's a number of initiatives that are happening in many places um, um, to try to do that from young programmer schemes so to talking to young people about how they do programming what they will program um, to youth film festivals that of, of, um, to getting young people making films and talking about films with it and this is all that the sit with the cinema as the focus for that and getting young people to be able to see the films that they make themselves on a big screen in the cinema to get them to understand the difference um, for that it makes from watching a, a small screen to to a big one and so there are lots of schemes like that across the UK now and also um, other people who you, you, you might might want to love to come to the cinema but feel there are barriers against them doing so so um, this is um, the, um, a mixture of um, images um, supporting those kind of initiatives so this is the um, um, the Fest, the Journalist Festival, um, uh, celebrating the creative talent of exceptional refugee and asylum seeking artists. Um, uh, there is um, Access Cinema, so there's a lot of schemes now to 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 um, ensure um, uh, that. Uh, people who have ba barriers to kind of their sort of sensory experience of the cinema can um, um, have um, accommodation made for them. So subtitled screenings, um, um, uh, uh, dementia-friendly screenings, and uh, screenings um, for people on the autistic spectrum. So there's this way of, of um, having, having screenings that are more the term that we use is relaxed. So it means that if you if you really want to um, sit down and focus and um, watch, um, 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 I'm just trying to think a new uh, Peter Greenaway. I just think a better better example, but a very intense film. So maybe the films in this festival, it's perhaps not the necessarily the appropriate kind of films for these kind of screenings, but lots of other films that are out there totally are. And I think it's just by very having these schemes, it shows that people are welcome, even if they need some level of support in coming to the cinema and some kind of, and tolerance of other members of the audience um, because of their situations. Um, and um, uh, another easy one of these kind of things, I think it's the way it started, would be parent and child, mother and baby screenings, which have been running um, for a long time as well, and enable people who can't, don't usually get out or can't usually get out to the cinema to be able to do so. So more traditionally are things like um, um, uh, talent Q&As. Um, so this is an example, I picked this one because... Um, Everyone likes Michael Caine. Um, is um, um, is but this was um, live and a cinecast. So this is something that festivals do. The London Film Festival does is they have, um, uh, but there are other um, other cinemas do as well. But if you have obviously a major star, 
um, particularly someone as old as Michael Caine, won't be able to get around too many cinemas um, in the way that some directors like to try to do when they're promoting a new film. But you can cinecast the Q&A um, around uh, a network of, of digitally linked cinemas. So um, that's another way of doing that to present um, a live, live experience. And I went to one recently with um, Susan Sarandon, actually, um, um, talking about a film she executively produced, which is the documentary about Hedy Lamarr, which is, I don't know if anyone's seen that, it's amazing. But, um, uh, um, and um, and it, it's, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty effective. It's not the same as, you know, seeing a person in, in the flesh, but it's still, uh, it feels, it's, it feels it's more than watching um, someone on, um, uh, just on television. And then there are other forms of, um, of cinema um, or moving image experiences, um, as you have here in this festival with the, the, uh, um, uh, the VR. And VR is, is um, increasingly um, uh, being talked about. Now, how that actually marries into um, uh, working with cinemas is, is difficult because it's obviously a totally different model of viewing than, than um, um, uh, the aud audience facing a, um, a, a, a screen. But it's still something that is being explored about how that might happen, how a collective experience might happen, um, how cinemas, cinemas might use this. At the moment, it's usually, you know, um, seats in foyers or in rooms on the side or as parts of festivals and so on but I don't think VR is going to go away so it's worth um, um, it's worth uh, continuing to think about that and, and um, um, and then there's um, um, the, there's this the um, UK's Virtual reality cinema opens in Manchester. Multi-dimensional film and gaming experiences. So the um, the uh, relationship to gaming is something, of course, which is very um, interest in, particularly to gamers, um, um, young um, younger audiences, and trying to find ways to uh, associate going this, going to the cinema with gaming is a way possibly to attract um, younger audiences who are very into gaming. Um, and of course, we've already seen with films on TV like sort of Black Mirror um, that it's a it's about interaction, and you can change the kind of course of the narrative um, through that. And I think there will be probably more digital engagement in terms of certain kinds of films um, where you'll be able to do that um, and therefore attract that audience. Um, but it's also um, I don't know if you're aware of Grenville Tower, which is a huge tragedy that happened in London um, a few years ago, where a tower block caught fire because of the incompetence of... Uh, uh, there was a, it, was, it had cladding of the wrong kind, which was highly flammable, and then the people were told to stay in their flats until they were rescued, which was completely the wrong advice, and, they, uh, um, and many perished, nearly 80 people perished. Um, and this, so this was... Um, um, this uh, company, 59 Productions, with Channel 4 Television, um, produced a VR film um, with the residents to talk about um, the, what the um, uh, what it was like there. So, um, uh, and it was an amazing um, picture of a very multinational um, community within this tower, and kind of what was sort of lost in terms of their, the lives of people. It was a give, giving testimony to people who, who their neighbours who were no longer there, but also saying why they liked living there and what it meant to them. And this was this, um, uh, and it was um, in VR, so it, it made you very intimate with what you were what you were seeing. Um, and um, it, you know, it's, it's particularly impressive use of VR on a more kind of sort of serious and artistic side than just in terms of kind of um, fun gaming kind of thing. Um, and then there's kind of things that are things that people do um, within the actual physical environment of the cinema. 4DX. I don't know if you've got any 4DX cinemas. So um, this basically means um, moving seats, um, bubbles in the air, wind sense. You know the seats can move like you're feeling like you're on a roller coaster, etc. Obviously, only 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 appropriate for certain genres of film. It would be rather. Um, 
you know, you wouldn't be wanting to watch a Jean-Luc Godard film in those kind of circumstances, I don't expect. Um, but uh, um, nevertheless, I think cinema is a place for everybody, and if that's what people want to do, um, why uh, not if that kind of works? But uh, there, is, um, there is a flip side... So, <laughs> I mean, she shouldn't laugh because somebody did actually die, but there is um, there is something about something about the you know cinema reeking revenge in some way. So I feel sorry for this person. I shouldn't laugh, but it's it's a story that I thought I wanted to kind of share with you because again, it's unique and it's those people at view again. So you know, keep popping up, don't they? Um, so. Those are various ways I think that um, cinemas can be uh, transforming themselves to attract new audiences in the era of streaming. Oh, oh, I missed that one out. That's Good. terrible. Good. Yeah. <laughs> How could I miss that out? Um, um, the um, uh, yeah. Uh, can you just move back uh, one second? Sure. So short. Oh no. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I move on? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the Prince Charles Cinema in the centre of London, just off Leicester Square, um, is committed to showing 35mm presentations and as are a number of other cinemas, including the British Film Institute, which has committed to show 35mm prints wherever they're the available and are of sufficient quality to match the digital versions. Um, and so this is um, it's, uh, this is obviously people then going to the cinema to see something which is materially different from um, in, in terms of its essence than um, uh, than what you would be seeing on a small screen at home, um, and this proves very very successful at the Prince Charles. And in fact, um, uh, Marco, the journalist who's um, been around the festival, he tells me he's actually a member of the Prince Charles, and he goes over to London to to see films there, which is uh, which is really fantastic. Of course. This is probably uh, financially only av available to cinemas that have, haven't ripped out their 35mm projectors because if they have, then to reinstall them would, be, would cost an absolute fortune. So, but some have com many have completely uh, digitised and don't have 35mm at all, which is a very sad situation. So, um, um, so there's a group... Uh, this is, uh, I've forgotten where this slide's from, I should have wrote it, written it down, but yeah, this is watching the screen while you're actually in bed, but it's a sort of mass sleeping in a huge cinema, which um, I guess if you're used to watching TV in bed, this is sort of makes it a super experience, but there we go. So this is kind of what I think, um, how these things can, might, might sort of come together in some ways, or some of the advantages of the kind of streaming world and how they sort of play out and, uh, in, in ways that might be helpful for the cinema. So Kira Knightley, um, streaming services are helping create more compelling roles for um, women, um, she said at Sundance um, last year. Um, and it's, of course, no uh, big secret why... Um, this actor gravitates towards historical and period set films and they offer the kind of roles she's eager to get her teeth into. Um, and she recently told Variety, I don't really do films set in the modern day because the female characters nearly always get raped. I always find something distasteful in the way that women are portrayed. Um, and I'm um, seeing more interesting roles for women. I think it's the advent of streaming services. We've never been frightened of putting women in lead roles in television. It's been film where there's been a huge discrepancy. Now that everybody is watching Amazon and Netflixes, they're binge watching these kinds of series. A lot of them are headed by really wonderful actresses playing complex, interesting parts. With film, I think for too long women have been silent. Our point of view has been silent. The way that the um, the way that we view the world, our stories have gone untold, and I think that's put us in a position of danger. And of course, in the context of uh, um, Me Too and Times Up, that's uh, very well um, spoken. And of course. Uh, um, and it's, I think it's absolutely true about better female characters in kind of high-end television roles and we're now kind of seeing that I think flow more into the film world taking um, a bit more notice about that so there's been, it's still very much on the agenda so here um, 
um, a, um, a few slides from a couple of in, a, a few interesting global conferences and festivals that have been going, um, and this is of course um, 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 CinemaCon, where Alejandro Ramirez, CEO of Sinopolis in Mexico, um, said movies have survived every technology, movie theatres have survived because they are out of home entertainment and because of the social and communal aspects of the experience. The main issue we have um, as a company is to keep alive the theatrical experience. And I think that's very important that cinemas start to understand exactly what it is that they've got to offer, the, the, which is, of course, the theatrical experience, the out of home experience. And and not think that they're, they're a, a, an equal alternative to streaming. Cine Europe, um, again, um, um, uh, conf, uh, global cin well, European cinema conference, and Ernst and Young, another accountancy firm, um, who came up with this uh, report that suggested that people who streamed 15 hours of content a week also went to the cinema at least uh, uh, nine films a year. Now, I know that doesn't sound very much for people like us, but I think in terms of the of, of certainly the UK national average, that's probably about three times the national average. Um, but also, the 48% of people who never streamed content also never went to the cinema. So there is possible that it's, um, it's this increase, um, streaming can increase appetite for going to the cinema, whereas if you're not interested in, in watching films, then you're not going to go anyway. Um, so here, Locarno. Um, he, um, here, of course, streamers energise the marketplace, but theatrical must be preserved. Um, and again, emphasising the shared experience, being in the moment, being fully immersed in the film, which has an, has, has an enduring value. Um, and um, again, the, 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 the need to get people off their couches. Um, and then um, Cameron Bailey from um, TIFF um, uh, saying uh, again, that the important what what um, the streamers do bring us is um, films that other people would not. So the availability of titles um, that would not um, otherwise be able to be seen from all over the world. And it's a very fair point. And then again, this film Araby, which I haven't seen. I don't know if anybody has, but it was apparently. Um, um, uh, it's been really praised by UK critics, even people do exaggerate, but saying possibly the movie of the decade, but it's re um, uh, um, um, it was ignored for um, two years, and finally, thanks to Mubi, it's now being seen on their platform, whereas it wouldn't have been, ever been um, seen before. So Mubi, of course, has a very different remit to Amazon and, and, um, uh, and Netflix, and picking up independent and little certain films and also showing um, historical films as well, international films, a huge range of films. They do a fantastic job. Um, but also they've now now they they're, they're actually looking for sort of for, forgotten films that should have had more exposure than they actually did, um, which is a great thing to be doing. Um, so I want to just finish with a bit about Ava DuVernay, the um, American um, director. And, um, and what she has, has said says here, one of the things I value about Netflix is that it distributes black work far and wide. 190 ca uh, countries will see When They See Us, which was a series. Um, um, I've, just, uh, I've, I've had just one film distributed wide internationally, not Selma, not Wrinkled, Wrinkle in Time. It's 13th by Netflix. That matters. And of course, some things do really matter. So I, I, um, I, I'm going to kind of show you um, the, the trailer for um, 13th and, um, uh, and then say why this, this, it's this particular film. I mean, it's self-evident why this particular film is important, but a, the particular example about um, how, it, how it was shown on Netflix um, can make a difference. Why not for a human being with their hands on bars? Shackled in the world are locked up here in the land of freedom. Khalid Bradder was walking home from a party when he was stopped by police. <laughs>
the Constitution makes it unconstitutional for someone to be held as a slave. There are exceptions, including criminals. The loophole was immediately exploited. And what you got after that was a rapid transition to a mythology of black criminality. needed to be controlled. You better believe it. It became virtually impossible for a politician to run and appear soft on crime. The kinds of kids that are called super predators. Millions of dollars will be allocated for prison and jail facilities. Three strikes and you are out. It was an enormous burden on the black community, but it also violated a sense of core fairness. because it has become heavily monetized. The focus is on taking people from prison, putting them in community corrections, parole, probation. How much progress is it really now there's a private company making money off the GPS monitor? We now have more African Americans under criminal supervision than all the slaves back in the 1850s. We are the products of the history that our ancestors chose. Set of choices that we have to understand in order to escape from. But it wasn't, no, it wasn't only on Netflix, because it's, it's a Netflix advert. No, but because the point being is that um, I heard this story from uh, B. Ruby Rich, who's an American film critic, if, any, um, if anyone uh, knows of her. Um, but she, was, she lives in Brooklyn, and she said that the, the, when the film was shown in cinemas, and first day in cinemas, it was also shown on Netflix. And Brooklyn's quite a poor area, it's quite a black area, some of it. And um, a lot of people can't afford to go and s go to the mm -hmm. cinema and see a film. So they, 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 there was people who went to the cinema to see the film, but at the same time, because it was such a hotly awaited title, that people watched it on Netflix at home as well, and they gathered around in groups to kind of watch it. And when, when the film was finished, people, they, people streamed out of the cinemas and people streamed out of, out of their houses onto the streets because the film was such a sort of important film. And so it wasn't exactly a riot, but it turned into a protest. So the film precipitated this, uh, this protest about the state of incarceration of, uh, of uh, African Americans. And, um, and, and then, of course, so that was reported on and the issue became much more talked about um, than if it was just the film in the cinema. This is a film about this kind of topic. It actually led to direct action. And I think that, 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 that this is, a, obviously, it's a one-off example. Not, not everything is going to do this. But I think it's a, a, it's, a, it's a good example to show that there is a positivity of the simultaneity of having...